In the previous three videos, we discussed setting up a new geological model, defining a custom boundary, and the different model building surface types available in LeapFrog. In this video, we will begin to build surfaces representing the different units within the geological model, but before we start, I'll discuss a few key points to keep in mind. Different users have different approaches when building geological models, but there are some fundamental concepts to understand that will make the modeling process easier. As we can see in this view slide, when you first create a new model, it is an entirely unknown volume, as can be seen in the output folder, that is defined by the extents of the model and cut by topography. The process of geological modeling in LeapFrog starts by using tools available under surface chronology to create contact surfaces that will be used to cut up that unknown volume into the respective units. Using this approach of starting with a finite volume and using contact surfaces to cut it into units means that inherently there will be no void space or overlapping volumes in the geological model. A few tips to keep in mind before we start building the surfaces. First, don't duplicate contact points during the modeling process. This will likely result in erroneous models. We will discuss this in more detail throughout the video. Second, when working in an environment with intrusive, potentially cross-cutting units, such as dikes or veins or intrusions, it's helpful to start building the surfaces youngest to oldest so the cross-cutting relationships are honored. The last thing to keep in mind before we get started is that we're about to generate only the first pass surfaces built directly from the borehole data with no additional input data or manual editing. Your initial surfaces are the starting point but will frequently require further editing to match your interpretation of the ground conditions. There are many options to edit these first pass surfaces and this will be the topic of a subsequent video. In this video, I will demonstrate the use of four core surface types, deposit, erosion, intrusion, and vein. In this model, it makes sense to model the water unit first and then focus on the bedrock units. I will build the water using the erosion surface type. In addition to modeling actual erosional contact surfaces, the erosion surface type is useful for modeling overlying units like topsoil, fill, casing, or water, etc. I'll right-click Surface Chronology and select New Erosion from Base Lithology. Set the primary lithology to be the unit you wish to model, in this case, the water unit. Next, you can choose to create contact points above the unit or below it. As there are no contact and lithologies above the water, I'll select Use Contacts Below. As we can see, the water unit contacts these three units. The granodiorite two times and the sandy gravel and silt units three times each. I'll click OK and LeapFrog will generate contact points and the corresponding water surface. The water contact surface now sits beneath the surface chronology folder in the project tree. By clicking the black triangle beside the surface, we can see the contact points that are being used to inform the surface. I will view these in the scene and then view the corresponding surface as well. If we look closely at the surface and the contact points, we will notice that the surface does not always pass directly through the contact points. Snapping the surface directly to the contact points, however, is very simple to do. Snapping can be set for the entire model or on a surface-by-surface -surface basis. In this instance, I will set snapping for the entire model. To do so, double-click the top-level geological model object in the project tree. There are three Snap to Data options, Off, which is the default, All Data, which will snap the surfaces to all import data, or drilling only, which will only snap to your boreholes, but not to any additional data, such as GIS lines, polylines, points, or structural data. The additional data will still inform the surface, even if it's not snapped. I will select drilling only and click OK. The model will reprocess, and we can now see the water surface is snapped directly to the corresponding contact points. All surfaces we build in this model will now be snapped to their points. 
To apply snapping settings to an individual surface, you can double click on the specific surface in the project tree and apply the snapping settings in the same way we just did. You may also notice that the water surface currently passes through boreholes it shouldn't. We will leave this for now, but address it in a subsequent video when we look at options for editing surfaces. Next, I will model the clay lens using the vein surface type. Depending on your project's geometry, there may be a few different suitable approaches for modeling lenses, but the vein tool is frequently well suited. I'll right click surface chronology and select new vein from base lithology and set the vein lithology to the clay unit. The resulting clay surface honors its contact points where they exist, but it also extends to the model boundary by default, passing through holes with no logged clay units. We will review the vein editing options available to fix this in a subsequent video. Next, I will build the granodiorite intrusion on the south side of the project area using the intrusion surface type. I'll right click surface chronology and select new intrusion from base lithology and select the interior lithology to be the granodiorite. Keeping track of the contact points that you've already created and used to build surfaces is very important for building closed and valid volumes in LeapFrog. To create valid models, you want to avoid duplicating contact points. In this case, I have already created contact points between the granodiorite unit and the water and clay units when I built those surfaces, therefore I want to ignore these two units when creating the granodiorite surface. LeapFrog will now only create contact points between the granodiorite and these remaining exterior lithology units. When I view the resulting granodiorite surface in the scene with the first two surfaces, we can see them cutting through one another. This is fine for now. We will resolve these overlaps when we generate the output volumes. The remaining three surfaces I'll build using the deposit surface type, starting with the contact between the sandy gravel and silt units. I'll right click surface chronology and select new deposit from base lithology and set the primary lithology to the sandy gravel unit. I'll ignore the water unit as I've already created and used the sandy gravel water contact points when building the water surface. Next, I'll repeat this process for the contacts between the alluvium and the sandy gravel units. In this case, the default setup is correct, so I'll just click OK to generate the surface. The last surface I will create separates the schist unit from the alluvium and sandy gravel units. I'll set the schist to be the primary lithology and accept the two contacting units as we have not yet generated these contact points. We now have six surfaces representing all seven units. It is typical to have one fewer contact surfaces than you have units as the final unit will either already be defined by an existing surface or it can be set as the background lithology, as we'll see shortly. You've probably noticed that all the surfaces are cross-cutting one another and look a bit odd, but this will all be taken care of when we build the volumes from them. To create the volumes, we need to activate the surfaces, which can be done by double-clicking the Surface Chronology folder. The most important part of this step is to ensure that you define the correct cutting relationships for the surfaces. If you know the age relationships for your units, that's great, and you'll want to place them in the youngest to oldest order in this list. Once the chronology has been defined, LeapFrog will take your initial unknown volume, which has been currently defined by the topography and custom boundary, and will use these surfaces to carve out pieces of that volume. The surface at the top is the youngest, and for intrusion, vein, and erosion style surfaces, it has the highest priority in the cutting relationships. The volume corresponding to the top surface will be created first, and then the next surface will be created from the volume that remains, and so on. For deposit style surfaces, however, the oldest surface is given the highest priority, but a sequence of deposit style surfaces will still be able to be cut by the other three surface types. Let's create the volumes to see this in action. I will start by placing my surfaces in an appropriate order. 
in this case, the order in which I built them. In some cases, the appropriate order may be quite unclear when you first start building your model, but fortunately, the chronology list can be revisited at any time by simply double-clicking surface chronology and the surface ordering can be changed as needed to generate the accurate volumes. To activate the surfaces and generate volumes, tick the boxes. Here, we also have the option to specify a background lithology if necessary. The purpose of this is, if after your volumes are generated based on your surfaces and specified surface chronology, you still have a remaining unknown volume, it can be set to the correct lithology using this background lithology drop-down. Depending on your project and the interaction of different surfaces, this may or may not be necessary. We will leave this at the default setting for now and click OK. LeapFrog will generate the volumes based on the specified cutting relationships and produce airtight interlocking volumes. Because of the way LeapFrog creates these volumes, it's essentially impossible to have overlapping or crossing triangles or spaces in the model unless contact points were duplicated during the surface modeling process. Now that the volumes are created, let's take a look at them. I recommend clearing the surfaces from the scene before viewing the volumes to prevent confusion. There will be seven volumes generated based on our six surfaces. Now that the geological model has been created, we need to check that it accurately represents the data shown in the drilling. One of the best ways to do this is by looking at both the geological model and the boreholes in the scene at the same time and creating a 2D slice. We will review the functionality of the slicer in the next video.